Greetings, I am the snarky apologist, and you are hardwired into the Interocitor Report. The views expressed in the Interasa Report are solely those of the Creator, the aforementioned Creator specifically being the Snarky Apologist and not God. The host of the Interasa Report reserves for himself the right of free speech and expression of such is deemed an inalienable right from God under the First Amendment, but at no time will employ it by wildly running and shouting fire in a crowded theater, unless of course it's an incredibly stupid movie. Any characters or persons portrayed in these videos without knowledge are highly encouraged to get an education. Any reproductions or reduplications of this material without the express written consent of the originators is forcefully encouraged. So, help me God. Greetings, my name is Bill and I am the Snarky Apologist. Now, going back to the Watchtower Society's belief that Jerusalem was destroyed in 607 BCE, now we've already seen that being dismantled. Um, there's a lot of information on the internet. I've done a couple of videos showing that not only has it been dismantled based on archaeological evidence and evidences that are available for all to see, not to mention the unanimous, <laughs> unanimous, coming together of all archaeologists saying that the 607 BCE is a wrong date. Be that as it may, the evidence speaks against the watchtower in an extremely high manner. Now, this video is going to go a little further and show you how a family named the Agibi family, they were very prominent in Babylon. As a matter of fact, there's some stories that talk about how they were part of the... Um, uh, those taken captive and uh, they learned basically or had come up with the idea of the banking system. So the Agibi family is said to have been the founders of the, of the uh, banking system that we have today. They had kept meticulous records. Now these are not just people in some home who saved the receipts from the grocery store and you know that kind of thing you know uh, but rather a business that extended from generation to generation to generation to generation, okay? Meticulous records kept showing beyond a shadow of a doubt who was king at a certain time in history. When you take all these documents that are time stamped and show the lineage of the kings the Watchtower 607 day, <laughs> big time. Watch this. Okay, here's what you do. Go on the internet and Google E-G-I-B-I, -I, the Gibby family, and you'll find that most sources, there's a tremendous amount. If you're dealing with Babylon or the ancient Near East or what have you, this very prominent family is used as a reference point for most of the archaeologists and scholars out there dealing with that time frame in uh, in Babylon and it's it's I mean they're they're a very prominent family they kept meticulous records so we know that because of the volume of books that are written out there uh, that that use them as a reference point we know we have accuracy so with that in mind let's move on the piece of evidence that we're going to look at today is known as prosopography. This is the study that identifies and relates a group of persons or characters within a particular historical or literary context. It's basically, you know, looking at, uh, it, it basically means face or person. It's defined as the study of careers, especially of individuals linked by family, economic, social, or political relationships, according to Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. In this case, we're going to look at the Agibi family. So, by far, the largest, the largest private archive of the Neo-Babylonian period is that of the Agibi business family household. Now, of this enterprise, the Agibi family, Bruno Meissner says, quote, from the firm, the sons of Agibi, we possess such an abundance of documents that we are able to follow nearly all business transactions and personal experiences of its heads from the time of Nebuchadnezzar up to the time of Darius the first. Now it was the Arabs in 1875 and 1876 that discovered all the business documents from the Agibi house. 
and they were found in a uh, in a mound actually uh, in a neighborhood that was about four miles southeast of the ruins of Babylon. They found about three to four thousand tablets, and they were enclosed in like uh, jars, uh, kind of resembling large water jars, and they were covered and cemented, and you know put you know tiles covering them, and you know for preservation. So they were they were uh, actually well kept and well maintained. Now enters William Saint Chad Boscoin. Boscoin was the one who was able to examine all the documentations, all the records of the Gibby household, and he wrote a report in 1878 which was entitled Transactions of the Society of Biblical Archaeology. In the report, he states that the tablets, quote, relate to the various monetary transactions of a Babylonian banking and financial agency trading under the name of Agibi and Sons, end quote. He says further that the tablets, quote, relate to every possible commercial transaction from the loan of a few shekels of silver to the sale or mortgage of, of whole estates whose value is thousands of manas of silver, end quote. So, Boscoin realizes the importance of following the sequence of the heads of the Agibi firm. He knows that if he could, if he can document who was in charge, who's the chief here at Agibi, he would have a succession because the, the records would show when somebody made a purchase that, you know, uh, John Smith purchased such and such a property in the third year of the reign of Nabonidus or whatever, right? So they were all time stamped in that fashion. So by showing all the transactions that were done and the quote time stamps of who was king at that time, he had a perfect sequence showing that there was no break as the Watchtower claims. There was no break and extra kings inserted or time frames inserted. No, he had an absolutely foolproof succession and evidence tied up into these documents to prove his findings. What did Boscoin's findings show? Well, it showed that from the third year of Nebuchadnezzar, there was a person named Shula who acted as the head of the Gibby firm or business, and he continued in that role for 20 years. It was up to the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar when he died, but he was succeeded by his son, Nabu Ahi Adina. Now, Nabu Ahi Adina continued as the head of the firm for a period of 38 years. That is from the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar to the 12th year of Nabonidus, when he was succeeded by his son, Iti Marduk Balatu. All right? So, Iti Marduk Balatu, in his turn, he remained head of the firm until the first year of Darius the first, which we know to be 521, 520 BC, which was the 23rd year of his headship as the kingpin over at the Agibi firms, right? So, what does this show? Well, this shows you that there was a period of 81 years between the third year of Nebuchadnezzar II to the first year of Darius. Now the reason that this fact is so important is that it totally agrees with the royal canon, the Neo-Babylonian historical records, and all other evidences that we have. Now counting backwards those 83 years from the first year of Darius in 521-520 BC, that brings you to 604 BCE. That's the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, and that completely agrees with all other lines of evidence. The watchtower is bankrupt. And, and you know, just to add insult to injury, which when it comes to the leadership of the watchtower is always a lot of fun, um, not only does this cover the Neo-Babylonian period, but because of the extended family and the decades of the, the Gibby household, they've got records that extend beyond the Neo-Babylonian period and way into the Persian era. 
So, where are we left? Well, here's the takeaway on the whole video. You ready? Number one, the Agibi firm banking records. Accurate? Yeah, you bet. Number two, it documents the chronological order of the Babylonian kings. Number three, it validates the sequential order of the kings that oppose Watchtower teachings. And number four, the Watchtower is once again busted and proven to be a false teacher.